Welcome to the Expansive CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Chapman, founder of Expansive CEO and X Squared Wealth Planning. Buckle in as we explore how to create true prosperity and build a business and a life that expands beyond yourself and makes a dent in the universe. Welcome everyone to the next edition of the Spicy Money Series. And today we're talking about sales. Now, first of all, feel that in your body. When I say the word sales, what comes up? What are you feeling? And does it feel like a, ooh, exciting? Or does it feel like a, ooh, sales? Um, Because honestly, in the way we present sales right now, we need to do some cleanup. And today I'm talking with someone extremely special to me, a mentor that I have been working with for uh, almost, gosh, not quite a year, but it'll be soon. Um, And we have got some amazing just information for you today. So why, why is sales a spicy topic? Why do we feel that it doesn't feel good to talk about when truly like sales are something that every single human, like not just business owners, every single human has to master sales in order to get their needs met. And yet, you know, when we feel like it's a dirty word, when we associate it with like a slimy salesperson, you know, and then we associate it with either being manipulative or being manipulated. And neither one of those feels good. So how do we shift? How do we shift out of that into something new? Here is Marla Mattinson, who is the creator of the ethical sales process, where she takes a relationship-based approach to sales so that you're starting, literally starting every interaction with a client, with a prospect, with a friend, with your partner, from the basis of relationship rather than transaction. And that's where we want to shift into. So Marla, thank you for being here. And would you introduce yourself a little bit further so everyone knows who we're talking to? Yes, thank you so much. I'm so excited for this conversation with you, Hannah. Um, What else can I say? Uh, I have been a relationship expert for decades. And, um, and so I've been invited behind the scenes with very powerful individuals and couples and business owners, uh, and business partners, and people share the real raw, intimate details with me of what's really happening. And so I take a very logical approach to emotional material. And because of that, I can build a bridge and help people understand how to build a bridge between where they are and where they want to be, whether that's getting their needs met in relationship, whether that's signing on an ideal client, whether that's, you know, somehow getting their message out into the world to receive more and more ideal clients coming their way. So um, my background is in neuroscience and mathematics. And uh, so again, that logical approach, I see the world in patterns. And I know that's one thing that you and I have in common. Yes. We like to geek out on that. <laughs> and um, yeah, so over the years, I've, I've been teaching sales for many years and the neuroscience of sales. And, um, and then I developed the ethical sales process so other people could understand how to build a genuine relationship with a potential client. And honor their clear choice by the end of the conversation um, so that even a no is something to celebrate because a no that's clear becomes the next part of the relationship, which is potential referrals. Because when somebody uh, receives a no from you with kindness and respect and care and consideration, it's like, oh my gosh, even though I didn't buy from this company, I want to tell all my friends about it because I had such a wonderful experience. And so I feel like that's probably a good place to start. Oh my gosh. Yes. So the pieces that really stick out to me um, in the way that you teach sales is from that lens of relationship, 
being a relationship expert and a relationship coach, it's like you have such a wealth of knowledge around like how do humans interact? And then the neuroscience aspect of it, yes, like I'm, you know, the data, the financial side of me is like numbers, Excel spreadsheets, like love it. And it's really the feeling of it, right? It's the emotions that come up. It's what our brains do in, you know, reaction to what our body is feeling that then allows us to actually make decisions. And the spot that I want to start from was when you feel a no, that is so powerful. When you can say no to a salesperson and have that be respected, like it, that's such a healing process. And when you can be that salesperson that can receive a no and celebrate it and understand that you're like, allowing that person to stand in their own decision and that that's that is healing i feel like that's how we uplift we uplift all of the you know from the very beginning um so thank you first of all <laughs> yes yes I, I i love it it's um there's so much goodness here you know you you started to talk at the very beginning about um transactions and the difference between a transaction where, you know, whether it's in your daily life, where it's like, you've got to get the kids out of the house, right. Or you got to make dinner it's or, all a sale, <laughs> right. It's all a sale. And, um, or the transaction of an actual financial exchange that if you put the human first, if you put the relationship first, when you're, when you're, you know, funneling the kids out the door, if you remember that they're kids, if you remember that you care about them and it's not just about getting them to school on time or it's not just about getting the getting to grandma's house on time, right? That it's about the journey of how are they being loved through that process, through the transaction. When the human is over the transaction, meaning humans over transactions is one of the pillars in my work, which is we care about the relationship more than the sale, more than the transaction. And this is one of the things I love about the ethical sales process is that it's actually a process for how to navigate any yes or no question in a sale that involves money or a sale that is just for your time, attention, focus, you see? So- mm -hmm. It's an exchange of value and the value exchange sometimes is financial and sometimes it is for your focus and attention. And if you think about it, you know, let's say you're scrolling on social media. The first sale is when somebody stops scrolling and they look at your post and then do they, did you continue to make the sale for them to listen to your video or audio or read your post? That's the second sale. And then do they click on something? That's the next sale. There's no financial exchange that's happened yet. It's all based on attention, right? That's the biggest sale these days is for your attention. Once you have their attention, do they go into opting in to receive something from you because they want more of your material? And so you get more of their attention. There's the next sale. Otherwise, what happens if you just go directly for, hey, you want to buy my $50 program or my $5,000 program, it feels aggressive. It feels like, whoa, where's where's the lube? You know what I'm saying? What, yes. what happened here? I feel <laughs> like, you know, you're asking me for sex on the first date as opposed to there's a romance period. There's a period of, you know, unfolding together. And then eventually, if your services align with their needs, then they step forward and say, I want to be in this conversation with you about an actual financial exchange. And so we can practice ethical sales throughout our entire lives. And therefore you don't need to ever feel awkward or uncomfortable in a sales conversation that involves money because you've been practicing it every day. Mm -hmm. And practicing receiving someone's full answer with grace and with love, right? Like in that That's way, right. if it depending on whatever happens in the, in the financial sale aspect, 
you've already practiced. This is, this is not your, your own nervous system is okay through this process. And then the more we can, if we, whichever side of the transaction we're on, the more we can be in our own sovereignty, in our own space, in our nervous system and calm, we can hold that for the other person across from us as well. Allow that more easily. So I want to tell a little bit of my story of how I came into your ethical sales process training. Um, it was such a beautiful confluence of events, like certainly synchronicities all over the place. Um, and my own journey with sales, being in the financial services industry um, and starting in financial planning specifically, there is a there's a tendency for larger companies to hire a lot of people and just like like throw in spaghetti at the wall, right? Like see who see who can make it through the process. And so that was the process when I started back in 2007 as well. It was bring you in, give you actual sales training, uh, but it was based on scripts. You, know, you memorize a script, you do, you know, you do the cold calling, you do the, you know, we would set out fish bowls. Um, and people, you know, get people to put their business cards in and then call every single one like a thousand times until they told you to stop. And I was <laughs> pushing through. I, I am a type A, like I will do the thing. I wanted so badly to succeed, to support me and my husband who was going to grad school. Um, so I did, I pushed, I pushed myself through extreme discomfort over and over and over and over and over again until, you know, it was a 12 week process. I lost, I'm not, a, I'm not a big person. And I lost like 20 pounds in the course of like 10 weeks. Oh, you must've been so stressed. I almost gave myself ulcers. Um, like, okay, this part's funny. I've never, I've never smoked. I, I actually, I'm a musician. I abhor like feel like even being in smoky places, you know, cause I, breathe so deeply from being a flute player, I would walk past people smoking outside and be like, oh my God, I wish I could have a cigarette. Uh -huh. Like it's so weird. So weird. Never, ever again, never before and never again, have I ever like craved a cigarette. I never, I still didn't try one. Um, but I was that stressed out. Yeah. I would do, I would do laps around the building. I would do cold calls for like a set amount of time until like I could feel like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get up. I gotta go do a lap outside around the building that I'd come sit back down and do more calls. And I felt, I, it just, it never felt good. It felt like it wasn't me, right? I didn't ever feel good in that process. And I actually, I did not, I was supposed to get five clients in 12 weeks in order to be able to stay as an advisor. I did not. I got one client. It was my mother. <laughs> Good old my, mom. My beautiful mama. <laughs> um, yes. Shout out to all the mamas. <laughs> yes. Uh, she's always been my biggest fan. Um, and yet, you know, it got me got me to the place where I was fully licensed. I knew what I was doing. I was incredibly like, I gave it my all. I gave it everything I could. And because of that, I got a ton of support from the leadership and they, they helped me find my next role, which is where I was, you know, I stayed for 13 years as a support first as a support person. And then when I felt ready again, I was like, I want to be an advisor. This is what I've always wanted. I want to go back to that role. I want to be the one, like, I love relationships with clients. I want to be the one building those relationships. So when I went back into that role, here comes the sales trauma, like coming back up. And ultimately, when I became an advisor again, the people who signed on with me, the new clients that I got knew me already. It wasn't a sale. It, it was, it was in the ethical sales process, right? Like that's, what's beautiful about it. It was a sale, but from, you know, like 
from cold calling or cold prospecting or anything like that. Like that's not where I was getting clients from. And somehow, you know, like it was not, it wasn't working the way that they said it was supposed to. Right. Or I wasn't getting clients in the way that made sense to the other partners, how they had done it. And so it turned into this like, oh, oh, this isn't working. This isn't going to work for me. I can't build my business the way that you built yours. And I also didn't have space. There wasn't space for me to be there um, in my in my own power, in my way, in the way that was going to work for me and in the way that I felt was ethical and relationship focused. And so that's one of the big reasons why I left and started my own firm. Fast forward to 2020, 2021, this is when I had to start selling on my own. It was on me, right? Like, so when you're an entrepreneur, business runs on sales, you have to sell. It's how, it's, it's how we, otherwise you, know. you don't have a business, you have otherwise a hobby. You Right. Exactly. So I'm like, all right, I got to figure this out. And it can't be the way that it was before. And at that time, my business coach introduced me to David Nagel and the, um, oh, what's his, what's his called? It's the life is now, um, not that, but his sales, his sales process, he has a mini sales training. I can't remember what it's called. Um, oh, but it was, you know right. what I'm talking about. I do. Um, <laughs> Conversion, compassionate it's conversion, compassionate conversion. Yes. <laughs> Shout Thank out to you. David Nagel. <laughs> Shout out to David Nagel. Um, yes. And he was a, he was a mentor of yours as well. Right, Marla. Um, and that was the first step that was like, oh my God, this is so different. This is so different. And it gave me a structure that I could start to follow. But at the same time, it still felt like, oh, you're still leading. You're still leading someone into the sale. The next thing that came up, the next thing, you know, things were going well, I'm selling, I'm getting clients into my world. And it still feels like there's, there's more refinement that can happen. This can, this can be, you know, it still feels like I'm leading someone into, into a trap, right? Like that's almost what it feels like, like. Like here, come into my, come into my little like bunny trap and so I can sell you. So I can sell you. <laughs> and that's when, that's when Marla came into my life. And well, that's, that, that was that, that piece right there, because I want to make sure that people understand there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with getting people into a funnel and saying, I'm going to sell to you. You just want to do it transparently. Mm-hmm. You just want to do it transparently because, you know, for those of us who are really sensitive, like you, like me, mm -hmm. that subtlety of funneling people in just to sell them in a sales conversation, that's what feels off because the end result, you already have set up from the beginning that you want it to be a yes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, or you want it to be a super clear no, you know, because David does actually teach you want to have clarity by the end. Yeah. You know, you want to have clarity. And so, and that is what I teach as well. I teach clarity is the main goal. It's not to make the sale into a yes. It's not to turn a no into a yes. It's not to manipulate in that way. So just for clarity on talking about one of my dear mentors, um, there is, you know, I've taken it above and beyond into how do you actually use a sales experience as a relationship builder genuinely mm -hmm. and as an awareness tool for yourself, because that's on the back end, when people actually get into one of my programs, you start to see how there's no separation between how you sell and how you be in life. And, um, and I think that's one of the beautiful, magical things about the work is, um, is what happens for you personally. So what happened for you with transforming where you were and how you felt about sales up until that point? Cause you felt like, oh, I've got a plan. I've got some good guidance now with David's stuff. And then you found me. And so then I'm curious what happened then? <laughs> yeah. So the, that's when the synchronicity started hitting, right? I, uh, um, 
I went to, and yeah, to be very clear, David Nagel is amazing. Like I highly recommend his podcasts, his trainings. Um, it, it will just open your mind and, yeah, and your heart. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I went to his, he is not doing it anymore. The art of success summit, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia in person. Um, and again, learned a ton and you were there and I didn't talk to you actually, <laughs> but, but you spoke, you got up and spoke at the microphone, um, and talked about research and development. And later on, I connected with someone who specializes in helping businesses get the right tax credit for research and development. And I was like, this is so weird. Like, I feel like I need to connect to these people just, just because like something was coming up, bubbling up that that was the right thing to do. Um, and so I followed it and I asked, I asked if you wanted that connection and you said, absolutely. Thank you. And I connected you two, and I was like, cool, that was great. Went on with my life. Two months later, my business coach, uh, Jen Germain at the time, she was with in your in your container as well, like in in Marla world. And she invited me. She's like, this seems like a place where you would you would really, you know, bond with Marla. She she kind of felt that connection. Um, and so she invited me into the what was it, the neuroscience of ethical sales at the time. And just the moment, the moment I stepped in to that Facebook container and watched you um, coach, you know, in different ways, it was like, it was like, oh, this is it. The way that you talked about humans over transactions, the way that you talked about relationship as the core, that is, you know, that is how I serve. And so those were the other words you said that in, in the July um, group as well, you know, sell the way you serve. And I was like, that is, that's it. That's what I want. I want, I'm, I'm already mostly doing that and I want to do it 100% that I serve based on relationship and I want to sell based on relationship 100%. And so that was, that was the, that was the switch. That was the, the language. It was like the language that I needed and, and it's, and it just stuck. Um, and from there, you know, again, it's, it's like, it's just this beautiful unfolding, this beautiful continuation. And we see it kind of in everyone who kind of comes into that container and into that ethical sales process world, we are all already on that path of, I love working with my clients. I only want to, I want to serve in the highest way possible. How do I make my sales process feel congruent? Right. That, that piece right there. How do I make my sales process feel as good as my fulfillment is? Yes. Or even better. Because when you sell the way you serve, which is the second aspect of my trinity of ethical sales. So just so people understand, we have three main guidelines. There's that I call the trinity of ethical sales. So one you already mentioned is humans over transactions. The second is sell the way you serve, which is what we're talking about now. And the third is celebrate choice. And that means a clear yes or a clear no. And if it's not a clear yes or a clear no, it's still the messy middle, in which case the sales conversation is not done. Even if you're done with that personal conversation in that moment, you need to continue on and have another conversation until there's clarity of choice that doesn't involve pushing or pressure or persuasion of any kind, just education. Education is different than persuasion. Education is used as a persuasion tool when, and that's what feels manipulative, you know? But if you yeah. actually educate from a perspective of, I just want you to be aware that this is what this means to work with me. And these are the qualities you need to have in order to be successful as a client of mine. Otherwise it's gonna be clunky and otherwise it's gonna not feel great to you or me in the fulfillment. So in the sell the way you serve, that's about transparency. It's like, here's how I serve. My fulfillment is epic, right? And your fulfillment is amazing. So all the entrepreneurs listening to this, you probably have amazing fulfillment. You care a lot about your clients and you, otherwise you wouldn't be listening to Hannah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> okay. So let's just shout that out. Um, so if you have great fulfillment and, it, and any part of the sales conversation feels uncomfortable to you, you'll love 
the ethical sales process because it cleans out all of that ickiness and, and replaces it with a process. No matter what you've learned and how to sell in the past, you don't have to start from scratch. You start from where you're, what you're already doing and you embed the ethical sales process in that and it naturally sort of de-slimes the entire experience. You gain confidence and the people that you're selling to, the potential clients, feel uplifted during the conversation and so do you. And there's no script. There's no script. And so it's like, it's off-roading and having an adventure and having fun and enjoying the conversation and getting to know somebody and learning how to confidently push back when they're not ideal. And so it actually shortens the sales cycle. Hmm. And so, because you get to a clear yes or a clear no faster, because you're not afraid to ask difficult questions. So sell the way you serve is all about transparency. And I'm, I'm just so glad that you brought it up because that aspect um, makes people feel really calm. You know, when you get to sell the way you naturally do your fulfillment of your services, it just feels like you use the word congruent. It just feels congruent. It feels in, in high integrity, which means integrated. It mm -hmm. means you are actually being in the sales conversation exactly the way that you are in your fulfillment. And that means that there's no bait and switch feeling. Right. Yes, that is. That's, that's the piece. And I, okay. So I want to open up the congruence part a little bit further because when I've, the other thing that I have realized in, in selling is that if you are ever in a convincing energy, if you ever have to, you know, uh, We'll put it this way, you know, I was I was also taught all of the the A to Z of closings, right? Like all the different ways to close yes. a sale, right? Like assume the sale and say, when do you want to follow up this day or this day? You know, like all of those things that again are can be legitimate like questions, but when you're using them as a manipulation tactic to short circuit someone's brain to get an answer, when you manipulate someone into a sale, they will always be looking for why they should not have said yes. And so the relationship itself starts and then, you know, they're questioning everything along the way rather than the way that I love. So anyone listening, you can't see my hands, um, but the way that you teach sales is that you come just not quite to the middle and you, the client, the prospect has to come and meet you. So now my hands are like really close. They're like really almost touching but you never, you never go and grab them and pull them in any way. The, that's the manipulation. That's the influence, that grabbing and pulling them in. It always has to be, okay, I'm going to step back. Do you really want to come with me? Yes, I want to come with you. I'm going to step forward again. Okay, I'm going to step back again. Do you really want to come with me? Yes, I'm going to step forward and we're going to shake hands and say yes. It's like teaching a kid to swim. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm right? It's the same thing. You kind of back away. You got it. You're doing it great, you know, and you can use enthusiasm as a, as an encouragement technique, you know, if somebody is an ideal client and they have a question and that gets answered and you're both excited about it. Great. Great. You mentioned manipulation. Mm -hmm. Let's get into that. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Manipulation. First of all, I come from a really interesting background, not only of math and neuroscience. I was a body worker, massage therapist for 15 years. I'm 803. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm 51. I'll be 52 next month. Um, but I've had quite a long um, life and I've done many things. And so for 15 years, I was a body worker and manipulation is part of body work. You're manipulating the muscles. Manip manipulation is not the issue. Okay. Manipulation in sales is not the issue, actually. It's, you already mentioned it a little bit. It's the intention underneath, okay? So here's the thing. We are human and humans manipulate. We're always going to try to get our needs met. And sometimes we do that in a really um, aware way. And sometimes we do that in a way that unintentionally hurts other people's feelings and steps all over people's toes, you know? And, and the difference is, 
the intention underneath. And so it's not about avoiding manipulation techniques. It's about practicing transparency when you're doing it. So manipulation means you want something to happen a certain way. So you can just say that. You can literally just say, I just want to let you know in this conversation that we're having right now, in this sales conversation, you are an ideal client for me. And so I'm already a yes for you. I'm already like, wow, it would be really wonderful to guide you. And I want you to know that. So instead of me feeling that and hoping for that and hoping for them to say yes, I can just name it. And we call that the narrative bubble. That means I'm saying the narrative in my mind out loud, out loud. And that's a relationship technique that we bring into sales. Because in a relationship, by the way, here's a little tip. Most couples, they don't say the thing that's really upsetting them until it's so big, it has to be said. Yep. And so the idea is share the narrative bubble first. And the narrative bubble sounds like, hey, babe, I just want to let you know I'm getting really frustrated. And I feel a lot of frustration right now because of X, Y, and Z. And I'm, I'm starting to lose my patience. And if we keep in the, continuing this conversation, I might actually bark at you. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to lose my patience in about three minutes. I'm feeling that rise in me. And I don't want to wait until a volcano comes out at you. I want to let you know that the way this conversation is going is making me start to feel really defensive. I feel like I want to go on the attack. I'm not doing it yet. I'm warning you that that it's rising. I'm not going to wait until I already feel that. And I can't articulate it because my brain has lost the ability of my cognitive function in my frontal lobe, because I'm in my limbic system in the back in my emotional brain. I'm not going to wait for that. It's starting to happen. And therefore I'm going to use the narrative bubble to say all of this. You don't have to do anything different, except if you can have a little compassion for me and we can de-escalate, that would be great. Or maybe we take a pause. So the narrative bubble in relationship is wildly helpful. Mm -hmm. And the narrative bubble in a sales conversation is revolutionary. The thing that just, the way that that just like uh, jumped out at me even more, because I've, I've heard you speak this concept before, mm -hmm. um, but it's like, it's, it's getting rid of the, like, we have to read each other's minds. Yeah. Just say it, just say the thing always. And then no one has to read anyone else's mind in yeah. any situation. Yeah. We can get out of fantasy also. And that's the other thing is like, if you really are hoping that they're just going to know what your needs are, whether it's your relationship or a salesperson or the potential client, like people don't. They don't know. Most of us are really self-absorbed. We really care about what's going on inside of us. And we don't want to harm anybody else. But, you know, most people are not practicing this. They're not practicing sharing openly what's going on for them. They wait until it's so unbearable internally for themselves. They have to say it. And it doesn't come out kind. It comes out really nasty. And I'll use a personal example on this because I think it's it's helpful so people don't put me on a pedestal or think that I'm perfect. You know, um, in my life, I've had a really hard time asking for help. I don't know if anybody else can relate. <laughs> okay. Hand raise, yes. Hand raise, okay. Um, anybody else? Okay, raise your hand right now. If people think you're crazy, go for it. Okay. Um, so asking for help was so challenging for me that because in my mind and in my background, I had some idea that asking for help was like some kind of a weakness or I should be able to handle this myself or what all the reasons, okay, why I didn't do it. And, and so I would unintentionally wait and wait and wait and wait until I really needed help. Not when I kind of needed help or needed a little bit of help or didn't really need it, but kind of wanted it. Like, not all that blew right by. Mm -hmm. I would wait until it was urgent and I needed help. And then how did that request come out? Like a demand. 
I need help. Are you kidding me? I've waited this long to ask you for help. So now I'm in urgent need. And now what is the answer that needs to happen? A yes. And if it's not a yes, oh, the fury. Oh, the rage. If I don't get my yes, when I don't even ask you for anything up until I really need it. And ethical sales says, you don't ask a question that you're not willing to hear a yes or a no. So I was not practicing that. And every time I've asked for help in a way that's a demand, that's not ethical sales. So the idea is not, is not binary. It's not like you're either practicing ethical sales or you're not. It's let's move closer and closer towards more and more ethical sales conversations, ethical sales exchanges. You know, when you're asking for something, ask yourself, are you willing to hear a no? And this is one of the things we teach Julian's daughter as well, who's 13 currently. Oh, you're asking us a question. Are you willing to hear a no? It's fascinating. Anybody who has kids, right, who are who are old enough to be able to understand that concept, um, like, are you willing to hear a no from this request? You're going to train your kids to understand that when they ask a question, it can't be a demand. It needs to be a yes or a no is acceptable because sometimes when we say no, she doesn't understand why. We have our reasons that she doesn't need to understand, you know, so... It's a relationship tool that when you re when you practice it, it's like, oh, since I'm willing to receive a no now, I ask for help when I don't really even need it because it's fun to collaborate with other people that I love and that care about me and my success and my life and just me as a person. So instead of waiting until I need it, now I ask for it just for fun. Ugh, yeah. So my youngest <laughs> is seven and a half. I have three kids. They're almost they're just about 12. By the time this podcast comes out, my oldest will be 12, 12, 10, seven and a half. That is the thing we are working on right now is, is when, is when she comes at us with a request, it's not a request because if it's a no, she's going to melt. Right. Right. Like rage melt sometimes this is the interim mm -hmm. it's amazing okay you're gonna practice this and it's yeah revolutionary because now you're not you're not saying no to the thing you're asking for her to reflect mm -hmm. right because if she's not able to hear a no then it's not really a question it's a yeah. statement mm -hmm. and the statement is a command or a demand and so that's the teaching. The teaching is not about you can't have ice cream. The teaching is not like, no, you can't stay up and, you know, later for bed or, you know, whatever the questions are. It's, it's a deeper teaching of a respectful question gets a respectful response. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so good. And so when we're listening, like the people who are, um, listening who are business owners, right? Like a lot of, a lot of us also have children. A lot of us also have partners, right? That concept of ask for help because that one, okay. So my clients in particular also tend to be like me who also tend to be like you, right? Like <laughs> we are cut from very similar cloth, that feeling of, I will just do it. I'll just keep doing it and keep the way that you said, like, I wouldn't ask for help when it was like, I kind of needed it. It was, it wasn't until I was like, I desperately need help that that has been me in the past too, where it's like, I would not be asking you this question if I had, if I could do it by myself. Right. And that, yes, the way that is received is not received as, oh, you're such a powerful person. Look at all the things you did before. It's received as, wow, you're kind of being a bitch right now. <laughs> right. Whoops. And needy and clingy and uh, demanding, demanding and controlling. And if you've ever been called controlling in relationship, which mm -hmm. everyone I've ever dated <laughs> has, has named it, and they're right. They are mm -hmm. correct. I'm absolutely controlling. And when I bring that to my relationship, it's horrible. When I bring that into my business, 
then I'm actually making choices. I'm making choices based on what I know to control this and, for example, create a safe atmosphere in my programs. I control who I let in. Mm -hmm. I control, you know, if you don't like fill out the application, you're not in, right? If you like uh, on a free Facebook group, if you don't answer the three questions, you're not in. So I do a lot of controlling in healthy, positive ways. I control things that I have control over, like what I eat and when I exercise and things like that. But when I bring that skill of control into relationship, oh, what a nightmare. <laughs> I, yes, I, I feel like the, that's such an easy question to, to, to frame it for yourself that way. Am I, am I willing to hear a yes or a no to this request? It's so simple. That's the beginning. So when you, I'm so glad we're touching on this because to me, ethical sales is a skill transference experience, right? You can transfer the skill set that you have in one area into another area. If you do it with awareness, you do it consciously. It's not going to happen naturally. This is not a natural phenomenon to bring the sales conversation idea into your everyday life. Most people want to avoid sales. They want to avoid that. So they're not thinking about how do I make that work in my relationship? The word sales itself is uncomfortable for most people. Um, and even if it's not uncomfortable, it's not super exciting and comfortable where you're like, ooh, did I make the sale? Right. right? That's maybe like 2% of the population might be excited about that, right? Like, right. So right. People... at most, <laughs> <laughs> at most, yes. So um, yeah. Where else would you like to go? Yeah, no, that's, I, I think that was really powerful. That skill transference piece where it's like, it's, it's not, it's not a thing that we put in a, a container, right? That's what, that's the visual looks like to me. We don't like put sales in, here's my sales bucket and that's it. There's nothing else Yeah, outside of that. I'm just going to, here's my sales process. Here's my sales script. Here's my ethical sales. You know, I'm like putting it all in my sales bucket. You're asking and inviting, you're inviting people to let's open that up. Yes. Let's see where it goes. Yeah. I, I, I would love to share one more piece about this, which is about receiving a no. One of the reasons why it's so hard to receive a no is because there's actual research on the pain of rejection. The pain of rejection has been found since 2003. That's 20 years ago right now, okay? We've known since 2003 that the pain pathways in the brain are the same when you experience rejection or physical pain. Same neural pathways in the brain. And that is like mind blowing. Basically rejection hurts. It hurts. When somebody says no to you, it physically hurts. And for some people, it hurts more than others. Some people have developed a thick skin. You know, a lot of sales trainings teach you how to be resilient and resiliency is about not taking on anybody else's material. You know, like let them have their experience. But we actually can't do that as humans because there's something called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons in our brain, in our heart, in our bellies are literally mirroring each other. And so you co-regulate with someone, whether you're on Zoom, whether you're on the phone, whether you're in person, you're co-regulating with people. And, and so you can't separate it. When you're in a conversation and you're listening to somebody's voice, the tone of voice, the frequency of their tone is changing your biology and they're changing yours. It's both ways. And so if you have to turn into somebody else in the sales conversation and shield yourself from other people, that comes off as defense and guarded, being guarded. Mm -hmm. And so this is why part of what I teach is moving from intimidation in sales where the salesperson is the, the one who knows everything and is guiding everybody into intimacy which is being unguarded and receptive which means 
you can receive the truth of this person, whether it's a yes or a no, you can receive, you want to know, do you need the services that I offer? And do you have the finances to invest? And are you going to be an ideal client for me? Because if you're not, you're probably not going to be as successful as somebody who would. And if I don't share with you what an ideal client looks like, sounds like, and the experience is like, how are you supposed to know? Oh, and by the way, if you have these other qualities, like you're skeptical and you want to just try to receive everything you can without, you know, paying or investing, um, you're not going to be successful with me. I don't, I don't work with skeptics. And so, you know, if, if those things are not clear in the sales conversation, then, you know, something happens for people where they, they re-traumatize themselves in the sales conversation, both the potential client and the salesperson, because everybody is guarded. They're trying to move somebody into a yes, but they don't even know what this person really needs yet. You know, what if the best thing is for them to practice saying no, have it be received and go work with somebody else and then a year later, they come back to you saying, I was so thrilled with how you handled me in that sales conversation with such care and consideration and respect that now I'm ripe and ready. Now I understand what it means to be an ideal client for you. And that's me. Mm -hmm. And I'm raising my hand now. It's powerful. It's really powerful. And people can learn this. They can learn it in a lot of ways, but they can learn it from you. So how can people get in touch with you? What's the best way for people to follow along, to, to take the next step to whatever that is to like the hands, right? Here you are presenting yourself. What's that next step that someone can take to come into your world? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. Um, there's lots of ways. One way is to go to Instagram or LinkedIn, uh, Marla Mattinson, find me and start following social media. Um, and then we're doing multiple trainings. So we're doing a one day training, um, uh, in the spring in April, and we're doing another one day training a little later in the year. Um, so for a, a really reasonable fee. And, uh, and I highly suggest that anybody who's interested in this come to that training. Okay. It's, it's highly discounted. I am really dedicated to getting this message out into the world widely. We need it. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you feel called to join our amplifier program, ESP amplifier, the ethical sales process to amplify it, that is, um, really life-changing, really life-changing. So, um, but first I would say go to a one day event um, and uh, it's all virtual right now. We're not doing any in-person events currently, um, but yeah, follow on social media. And then when we announce, you know, uh, join my list and um, we don't ever send extraneous emails. It's all on purpose and it's rare. <laughs> okay. So um, you're not going to get spammed or anything like that. Hello, ethical sales. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to get two two a day emails from. <laughs> no. Oh God, no, no, no. Um, yeah, and then join one of the one day trainings sometime this year. I think you probably would really enjoy it. If you're listening to Hannah, you're listening to this podcast, uh, you're probably going to enjoy this. And whether you join the um, more in depth training or not, you're going to get a lot from the one day training. And then, um, oh, we also have an assessment. We have the five sales personality types yeah. to find out which is your dominant sales personality type. It's so fun. Let's definitely give the link for that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's informative and it, oh, it takes three minutes or less. So it's really, it's short, it's informative and you'll find out your dominant sales personality type. There are five, I'll just name them real, really quick. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. rock star, the cheerleader, the leader, the fire starter and the Zen master. And the idea is actually you want to uh, develop all five in yourself so that you can navigate any aspect of a sales conversation. Oh, it's so powerful. And I can say from experience that it truly is life-changing to, to have the experience of a sales conversation literally with you, Marla, um, being in one, you know, like feeling nourished from that experience myself and then applying that to my own sales conversations 
in business and in life. So thank you. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Um, I cannot wait to hear how it resonates for people. If anything, anything comes up, if you're feeling something, if you're excited, if you're questioning, whatever, whatever is happening inside of you, reach out, let it all in and, and reach out and, you know, reach out to me, reach out to Marla um, and let us know, let us know Absolutely. what resonates for you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening and be sure to like and subscribe. And again, if anything resonated with you from this episode, I would love to hear from you. Email me at hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, at expansiveceo.com and tell me about it. And if you're ready for your greatest expansion, you can find ways to work with me at expansiveceo.com and at xsquaredwealthplanning.com. That's X, the numeral two, wealthplanning.com. So until next time, remember that there is enough, you are enough, and your birthright in this lifetime is to be expansive. <laughs>